Welcome to the Dream Job Podcast, Episode 5. I'm Mark Iztook. Katie Featherston is a creator. Now, you may know her as an actress from the Paranormal Activity movies, or maybe as a singer if you caught her EP here with me. But as I learned after our chat, I think creator is a better job title. Now, first things first, Katie is a fellow Texan, and that is kind of how we know each other, having connected on Twitter through a mutual love of our home state. Though Katie and I went to rival colleges, TCU for me, SMU for her, we grew up literally Literally a few miles apart in my hometown of Fort Worth. And that shared Texas background is certainly a theme in our discussion. The fact that she showed up for our chat today bearing gifts, a fresh bowl of queso, only cemented our Lone Star connection. So even though Katie went to SMU and lived in Dallas for a while, I still think there is plenty to learn from her story and her journey and the challenges that she has faced and overcome in making a career as a creator clear eyes full hearts can't lose <laughs> i figured it would be appropriate to have a little texas flavor I to like the that. beginning right i like that yes. uh well we have our shared texas roots uh, katie featherston uh from i would imagine like maybe 15 miles down the road from, yeah from where i grew up in fort worth yeah so my mom i lived with my mom in arlington and then my dad lived in fort worth so every weekend i was driving all around trail lake and tcu and the whole camp Bowie, Hewlin, yeah, yeah. i-20 the, oh the book stop across from Hewlin, the Hewlin mall was like the book stop that i got all of my books at growing up i so. mean how many hours did i spend mm. in that bookstore at that mall yep uh, i feel like we could geek out on texas stuff for the next hour um, mm-hmm. and alienate anybody else who <laughs> not. is not from the lone star state and does not have the affection for uh, the greatest state in the union that uh, we both do. Um, but thank you for hanging out with me. Oh, man, I'm so happy to be here. So it's the Dream Job podcast. A lot of people, I imagine, think that you have the dream job, the job they would love to have. Is is th- what you do now, is this what 10-year-old Katie Featherston dreamt of someday doing? Yeah. Living in Los Angeles, Instagramming pictures of her dog. <laughs> um, I The dog is an, a, a, like a, an added bonus. That's, I did okay. not know that I was going to have such a great dog. I, you know, you thought you'd have a good dog. He's, Maybe not the great dog. He's, he's, he's pretty great. I, you know, I decided to be an actress. I remember it. It was the very first day of seventh grade. And before that, I had wanted to be a pediatrician um, because I basically liked the approval I got from adults when I said that out loud and they would all go, Oh, good job. And I'd the go, yeah, back exactly. And, yeah. And then in the first day, so of you seven, were tuned into the idea that grown ups bought into that. I, well, I, I knew that. I liked the idea of helping people and you know, I don't know. It was like pushed on me. Like you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or, you know, all the like, you know, quote unquote, like good jobs that adults want kids to have. Right. And I was like, Oh, I think I'll be a pediatrician. And they're like, great choice, Katie. We don't have to worry about you. Right. And, uh, and then the first day of seventh grade, I, I did this improv in, in class and I was like a painfully shy kid. And I just thought oh, I can be scared this whole year. Or I can just get up there and do it. And so I did it and people laughed and I was like, what, this is it. What was the class? It was a drama class, but it was like a very entry level, like speech drama class. And, and she was like, we're going to do an improv. It's an aerobics class. Who wants to go up and be a part of the aerobics class? And I just thought, what am I doing in here? Okay, I'm going to go. And it was life changing. Um, and this is which which junior high? Uh, Barnett Junior High mm-hmm. in South Arlington. And who was the teacher? Uh, her name was Mrs. Morgan, I believe. Um, and I only had her that one year. Um, but it was a pretty pivotal moment. And so – from then on, it was – I was just like full steam ahead. Like my junior high class was all so I could get as prepared as possible for high school. And I uh-huh. walked in that high school and I was like, I'm going to own this place, you know, and I'm going to do everything I can in high school so that I can get into a good theater college. And then in theater college – Not a med like, school? Not a good med school? Nope. Nope. I, that ship sailed. My my dad, I think, was like, oh, she's going to change her mind. She's going to go back. And I never did. And then – and so I, I think I am doing a version of – of what I had dreamt of doing, but I think it's actually evolved over time mm-hmm. and is, I think, in some ways more difficult and in some ways different, but m- overall, I think better because I didn't know what was all out there when I was young and I do now. Better so. how? Um, better in that I 
for so long I identified as an actress. Like I made that decision and then that was my identity. I was Katie Featherston, actress, period. And that was that was the, you know, twenty year old Katie who's in college, or that's once you're out here and you're working? That was seventh grade Katie. Okay. I mean, and and that's a long time to identify with something so specific. Right. right? Especially because most people don't decide what they're going to be until yeah. they get to college and or beyond. I, and I never varied. It was it was such a – and it just kind of un, in, unfolded and became something I loved more and more and more and more. And I think now um, I went through a period where I wondered if I still wanted it, mm-hmm. you know, if, if I was doing it because I had committed to it so young and didn't – didn't wasn't brave enough to try something new or if I really did still want it. And so I like took some time and kind of kind of wrestled with that and then realized it was like, oh, yeah, I, I do want to be an actress. But I also I re- what I really want to do is be a creator. And so that can mean a lot of different things. And so I never growing up, I never thought, oh, I'm going to write songs and make music or I'm going to produce something or I'm going to be a storyteller on stage and tell these, you know, there's all these sorts of things that I want to do now that I didn't even think of when I was young. So in that way, it's better. My like scope is bigger. Well, I'm glad you said that because I, I do think obviously people are familiar with your work uh, as an actress, but I think that term creator is a better describer, descriptor of the different things that you do between acting, producing, directing, some writing. Yeah. Some some music. Some music. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, let's see. What else do you paint? Do I you do cro- paint. Do you crochet? I knit occasionally. Knit? Okay. All right. So you cook. I do cook. And bake. I, to I all, do I bake? Do you bake? Okay. I mean, I don't bake well. I'm going to be honest with you. I made some cookies once and I posted a picture of like w- what the, the batter looked like before I was going to bake them. And it was like a soup. And my friend, my friend Amber, who can make mm, cookie soup, cookie soup. That's basically and it just turned that into actually like sounds really good crumbles. So I just had a handfuls of cookie crumbles. So I wouldn't put that on my business card. I'm just trying to think of all the different ways people can create that you could add. There's it's endless. To the list. It's the only thing I couldn't do is, is I think, be a good baker or, or be a good dancer. I, I'm mm, not – I would not okay. – I'm not going to win any awards for that. No uh, pasta doble in your future. No, no ballet. No, no rumba cha-cha. None of it. That's all right. None of it. We, we got to know our limitations. Yeah, you know. But I, I, I think if, if that's – you talked about viewing yourself as an actress mm-hmm. and then this expanded kind of umbrella of being a creator um, – there's something invigorating about that, obviously, which is what draws you to creating. What do you think that is? Because it's not the kids laughing, which is what it turned felt, the lipo right. bomb in seventh grade. Right. It's got to be something else. It, you know, I always thought growing up it was the part. It was the part that I had. It was the feeling of creating a character. It was, you know. But it was interesting when I went, when I decided to, to record some of the songs that I had written, I went to Nashville. And my good friend Clint Wells, who's this like – magical guitar player songwriter out there he produced my ep and basically i spent a week trapped in a studio with two guys who were super funny super talented and they brought in all these great musicians and we created we took you know my like threadbare songs with just me and like a tiny guitar and he and we turned it into these these beautiful fully fledged pieces of music and at the end of the week i was so invigorated and so full of life and so happy and so just grateful Mm -hmm. and i realized that that feeling is what i'm going for and that feeling can happen if i'm in an ensemble on stage it can happen if i'm stuck in a studio with two really funny guys and we're making music it can happen if i'm producing something it can happen if i workshop a story and i tell it in front of an audience of people and they receive it it can happen in good conversations when you're you know it it, it can happen anywhere and so Mm -hmm. no matter what it is i'm creating it's not really about the thing it is about telling stories that are important to me, but it's about the experience of telling that story. And that experience comes from who I'm with and hmm. the connection that's happening. That's interesting. That Do you think – I mean that's very self-aware to kind of understand what it is that, that motivates that process. Mm-hmm. To say it's not about the thing. It's about the feeling and the experience and you know, kind of the, the – uh, it's not the destination. It's the trip. Yeah. Um, when did that – light bulb turn on for you? When did you realize that aspect of when I went to Nashville? So I I did the EP a couple two maybe two years ago now. And before that, that was kind of in that in that time where I was like, do I really want to be an actress? By the way, shameless plug. Here with me. Oh, available yeah. on iTunes. Oh, yeah. Right. There you and go. All of the proceeds go to the um human rights campaign and center for reproductive rights. So you know there you go. Um but uh 
Yeah, because that was that was around the time when I wasn't having a lot of fun auditioning and it wasn't feeling I didn't feel passionate about it. And I was kind of afraid to to let go of this title of actress because if I wasn't an actress then what what am I right you know oh, yeah. which is so your silly, identity is, is so, kind of woven in which into I that. knew was unhealthy but I didn't know how to do it any any differently and then I went and I and I spent an entire week being so creative in a way that was so foreign to me hmm. and it filled me up more than I could have ever imagined and I all of a sudden was like oh oh yeah I'm I'm I mean all of us are so much more than than the things we label ourselves with. You know, it's like, oh, I'm a storyteller. I'm a creator. I, I am an actress. Yeah, sure. But that's not all that I am. And so that was really like, I don't know if my friend Clint will ever know how like life changing that project was for me. Because for him, it was just fun to hang out with friends and make music. But for mm. me, it was it was pretty big. Scary? Um, Yeah. It was scary to make it. It was scary to sing because I like to sing, but I don't like to sing in front of people. So, you know. Um, the doing so it. So go make an EP. Yeah, right. I, I yeah, but I, you know, when 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 a real musician who I respect so much, you know, offers up something like that, you say yes. You know, you don't go. Ah, I don't know. I'll just stay home. No, you say yes and you go. Mm-hmm. So there was no question there. Um, it was scarier to release it than it was to make it. I think I sat on it for a long time, hmm. um, which was fine. Just then, waiting to click submit to the iTunes store, that I, kind of thing. Yeah, I think I. I think it went back to the whole like if if I made something acting related, then I would feel fine sending it out into the world because I own that part of myself. Okay. But, and, but and and that's a label you're comfortable with because you've worn it, right? And while. I've worked on it and I've invested in it. But this was something new, and you know, it's this. It's kind of what we were talking about before we turned on the mic. It's like you just gotta sometimes put yourself out there and sink or swim, right? You know, and and that's and 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 I think. Whether you sink or you swim, there is a real success in 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 the doing of it, hmm. you know, because that's the difference between, I don't know, people who at the end of their lives look back and go, wow, like, look at all these things I did and tried and look at what happened versus the people who look back and go, man, I really wish I had done that. You know, I don't want to I don't want to look back and go, man, I really wish I had done something. I think the hard part uh- – for maybe somebody who's listening to this and they think, yeah, but I'm not creatively inclined. I'm not an actor or an actress. I don't want to paint. I don't whatever. I think maybe the lesson there is whatever it is, reading, traveling, eating at amazing restaurants, whatever it is that gives you that feeling of joy, of satisfaction, of contentment, whatever, um, whatever that pursuit is. Go find it. Yeah. Because I, I, I feel like it's easy to kind of lump people into a binary of, oh, the creatives and the, the non-creatives. Right. But I, I don't think that that feeling um, is. I think we all have that feeling. And I yeah. also think everyone is creative. Like people think crea- creativity means you have to make something artistic. And that means you're creative. I think you can be creative in business. You can be a problem solver. You can be someone who knows how to put people together in the right way, knows how to navigate a room full of people, knows how to, you know, deal with personalities. And that that is a certain type of creativity and like an intuitive awareness. And and, and so I think everyone is creating all the time, whether they acknowledge it or not. I think the idea that uh, that feeling that you described, though, is not exclusive to people who know that part of themselves, that that's empowering. Yeah. And, you know, it could be working with kids. It could oh, be, yeah. you know, volunteer. It could be a million things. Yeah. I've, I, I figuring started. Figuring out how to check that box for you. Exactly. I started volunteering this past year and um, I go every week and, and I'm sitting in a tiny room full of like really lovely people who are in a line of work that I know very little about. But we are all kind of similar souls and we spend four hours a week together and we love each other and it's so fun. And then we are also helping other people at the same time. And it's that same feeling that I get, slightly different, but but at the root of it, it's the same feeling I, I have when I'm making music or when I'm, you know, producing a short film or whatever it is. And so for me, it's just like I'm always searching for that emotional high. I imagine just based on what I know of you and where we're both from um, – uh, you know, relatively small town Texas compared to Los Angeles, right? At least uh, for me, the move out here was something that would have never been on the radar. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a part of that reserved aspect in Texas where the creators are the people who are kind of they're a little out there, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm not out there, so I I can't do that. Right. So it was 
did you have a hard time getting over that hump at all? Yeah, I I remember in college, I I SMU has two <laughs> SMU. It's like a little, Go a little competition there. Mm -hmm. SMU has two uh, like theater tracks. They have I, I, the acting track, and then they have the other. I can't remember the other one was called, but I got in on the other one, and the other one was like you're directing, producing, writing, and acting, right? And I was like, nope, I want to be an actor. So I got in, and then I was like. Put, move me over to the acting guys and you have to like petition to be moved and everything and they don't do it all the time and they did for me and I felt very safe being in the acting track and that like I look back on that and I go huh that was in me the whole time mm -hmm. to be the producer and the director and the writer and the actor I just wasn't ready I was scared and then I came out here and I remember my mom would be like Katie you just need to make your own work like like you've got all these ideas you just need to do it and I'd be like yeah 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 uh, yeah sure um, and and then would continue to go audition or right. even making the first paranormal activity movie. If I really look back on that, it was the three of us. We were improvising the script. Like I would make a shot list for the day because I ha I'm so type A, I have to be organized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Warren would say like, OK, well, we're going to do these. And I'd be like writing down all the specifics and I had I'd be like marking them off the list. And so there were all of those things were kind of brewing in me. I just had to own it. Oh, fascinating. Uh, so you, you did bring up paranormal, paranormal activity. I want to mm -hmm. start connecting the dots between Texas and and that experience. So SMU, as you mentioned, you go yeah. to SMU and you know by that point, okay, the pediatrician thing, I left <laughs> that behind in, in junior high. So you're on the acting track. And how quickly after you graduated did, did move? you move to Los Angeles? I graduated in May and I moved out in August. And I waited tables. All the theater kids waited tables at Buca de Beppo in North Park um, back in back in Dallas. And so I worked there every summer. And then my senior year, I worked there throughout my senior year so that they would transfer me. And it, was, so, it was Chili's for me. See? Chili's yeah, on University go. Drive oh, in Fort yeah. Worth. If someone wanted a grilled chicken pasta, I feel you, like I could still go. Guy. I sometimes have dreams slash nightmares that I'm still waiting tables. I, that's not take the dream part off. That is a nightmare. Yes. It, I, yeah. It, it, Cold sweat. Just you're in the weeds. I, you forgot somebody's Diet Coke. A church group comes in. They're not going to tip you. <laughs> mine. Mine is that I go there to eat and they're busy. And I'm just like, guys, y'all are here. Let me just help. Let me just help. And I and I start to help. And then by the end of the shift, I like look up at the schedule and my old boss um, has has added me to the schedule and i'm like wait no 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 i was just helping one night i'm oh my god I don't. oh man we and can then, psychoanalyze this and then i realize and then in the dream i realize wait a minute i don't i don't have to do this anymore like i'm i'm okay now okay no no, no. and then i wake up from the dream so That's i wake a myself whole narrative arc of yeah. of deeply layered yeah. insight yeah into your fears and your hopes yeah. right and then I, mean, I like get myself out of it which is also interesting hmm. mm -hmm. um all right, so you Buca de Beppo in North, uh, in North Park. Park. And then, yeah, and then moved out in August and marched into the Buca de Beppo and City Walk. You're like, I've got big goals. Yep. None and of this like, Dallas Buca. I'm nope, going, straight I'm going up Hollywood Buca. City, City Walk Buca. Ugh. And uh, worked worked <laughs> there for five years. And it was. C explain City Walk for people who have oh not been to gosh. Los Angeles. It is the place where dreams go to die. It but, is, but they get like painted in Technicolor on the wall. And there's glitter and there's, yeah, there's lights. A of, there's there's, there's a lot of. It's like the strip in Vegas, yes, but not. I, and in Los Angeles. I actually tell a story about City Walk and I, and I compare it to like the kind of sexual griminess of the Vegas Strip. Yeah. Combined with just like a sea of baby strollers in like a 405 kind of gridlock. That's what it. But with like big lights and music and like weird so stores that sell like novelty socks, you know, it's just very, it's a very, and it's a long walk from the employee parking to Buca de Beppo. And when you wipe the tables, you can just feel the, the sadness. Oh. It's oh. like a film. Yes, it is an intense, it is an intense But hey, place. if you're from out of town, you really should go visit. You know, check out the it de is, there. it's bright and colorful and, you know, you can see a movie, you can buy some candy at the candy store. I have not been since... I left that. I don't think maybe once. I like think you've, you've, you've done your time. You've yeah. had enough. All right. So long story short, it's Buka in city walk. Yeah. Uh, yeah Universal city walk. Yeah. And, and you're just plugging away. I just you got the headshots. I've got the, I knew I look back on the 23 year old me that moved to Los Angeles, not knowing anyone, not knowing anything about how to be a business person or a businesswoman in this industry. And I think, God bless you, child. You have no idea what you're about to get yourself but into. That, but isn't that almost a necessity? You have to. Yeah. You had to be 100%. that naive, ignorant, if you will. Yeah. I mean, because I, I know I certainly was. Yeah. And and just with this kind of unwavering 
faith in yourself. You know, it's like, okay, well, of course, of course. Because I remember growing up, people would be like, oh, you're going to be an actress. Well, what are you really going to do? And I would just kind of go, oh, I'm really going to be an actress. Just yeah. And do you have like a list of those people that you can oh, kind of go back? I don't, and, I don't need, it's like in my mind, like yeah. all of them, I know them, family members, teachers, like all sorts of people. And they all, and I knew they all meant well. I was just like, oh, you've got a lot of fear. I don't, I'm going to go do this, you know? And, and it, you know, I think that that is really serves you, mm-hmm. you know, really served me. And, and I look back on that and I still have it, although life does have this habit of kind of taking some of that and, and, you know, it's hard to hold on to that in such a a pure way the older you get. But I I still try to really cling to that and go, oh, yeah. I think that's another one of the lessons, just the the anchor that fear is. And I'm certainly not uh, past that anchor and having that around me sometimes. I think that's like big life lesson of how to not, how to, how to like not operate from that place, but how to operate from the, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's that age old piece of advice that you, you regret the things that you didn't do more than the things right. you did. And I think fear is, is the reason why. Yeah. But the fear didn't keep you from making the move. No. You land out here. Mm-hmm. Where? Uh, Sherman Oaks. Um, an apartment right across from Whole Foods, right by the right by the 405. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it looks, <clears throat> looks much nicer now than it did when I moved here 12 years ago, but it was a very cute apartment. I lived with my roommate of mine um, who I also went to college with. So it was just she and I. We were both working at Buca de Beppo. And, yeah, I just – Got some headshots and started auditioning on like LA casting and waiting tables. And I don't, I I just, I just kind of put my head down and started going. I, but I knew nothing. I started a scholarship at my, at my college for like theater kids as they're graduating because no one tells you how expensive it is. At least no one told me how much it costs to, to like, really get a good foundation of of materials that you need as an actor on top Mm. of paying rent on top of having an acting class on top of living in los angeles and so um and so i did that so that people could get their like you know first set of headshots or their first acting class or whatever just you know i wish i wish the only thing i wish is that i had come out here with katie had been around to help i wish that i'd had a mentor i wish that yeah that that 35 year old katie could go back and tell 23 year old katie okay girl this is this is what you know Mm -hmm. you got to look forward to this is what you this is how you navigate this um there is something to be said for learning that stuff on your own but but also mentors are nice there's a 45 year old woman out there who wants to mentor me now like just bring it just i welcome it okay so so pick an oscar winning actress that if you could say Diane Keaton, will you mentor me? It wouldn't. It would be Lauren Graham. Ah, she went to SM, she went to SMU. She was in theater there. She's in grad school there, and she's just. I read. I read both of her books. She's so down to earth and cool, and seems very level headed. And and there are, are a lot of similarities between she and I that I'm just kind of like, oh, what would Lauren Graham do in this situation? You know, I've I've met her a couple of times uh, just in interview situations, mm-hmm. uh, but always been charmed. Yeah. by her, and I love yeah. her work. Mm-hmm. So I, I think too. you picked a good yeah, potential see? mentor. So Thanks. Lauren Graham, if you are <laughs> if listening, you're out there and you hear this. Yes, Katie would love to hear just, from you. Yeah, let's just have I'll like buy you a coffee. Let's just talk about life. We can talk about Cecil O'Neill, who I know that she liked a lot. It's one of our professors. There you go. Who is the only reason I graduated, so I have a fondness for him too. Um. All right, you're in Los Angeles. You've got the headshots. Got the headshots. You are going out on auditions, and what was the first audition? Was there was there one that went well for you, or was Paranormal Activity the the? I remember I I got a commercial agent, <clears throat> like, I'm, and I was non union, so I got a commercial agent, and I did some like used car commercials in San Clemente and. Some weird. Are you selling the Datsuns, the two forty Z? I was saying something like, "Come on down." To- I was saying something like, "If you don't have any good, you don't have good credit. No problem. Just come down here, and we'll something sell you this car, and you'll love it." And very smiley. So that kind of stuff felt like a success. And then I was in this. I had this one scene in a really horrific, scary movie. It was not scary. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had one scene in that where I like did all of this prep work. I was took it very seriously. I did all this background on my one scene for this one character. And I get there and the woman's like, um, so you know your character's a prostitute, right? And I was like, I'm sorry, what 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 was that? She's who a what? That, what? Huh? Who the, that what? I didn't I didn't that's not in there. Hmm, interesting. And I think you ought to mention that so, breakdown. Yeah. So, you know, 
I had those kind of those kinds of things. But the first audition that felt different was the Paranormal Activity audition. Mm-hmm. And, and you had to drive down to San Diego for that, right? Or did I, you come up here? I auditioned in North Hollywood. Okay. Um, but then we shot it in San Diego. But it's a Craigslist ad? It was. Mika or, always says that. Maybe he put it on Craigslist. I got it on LA Casting. Okay, got it. And I remember reading it and thinking like, man, this guy is taking this seriously. Like this seems creative. There was just something about it. I've heard you say that before, yeah. that you knew, you're like, this has just that little There's spit and polish there. that makes or you think. Or maybe it was just something in my heart that went, this is going to, you know. And auditioned, uh, you know, impro- improvised the audition and and then improvised the callback, met Mika at the callback. And mm-hmm. it's it, one thing that's really cool is that I he released the audition tapes this past year, and I hadn't seen them until now. And I looked back at that 23-year-old girl who was so confident, who just walked in that room, sat down, Owned it. And at the end of the audition, I'm like, hey, so when will I know? You know, and I, like, who, I was like, who is she? Where does she go? You know, mm-hmm. so it's so interesting to kind of look back at where you came from and, and to see what you've lost and what you've gained and how you've changed over the years. I could talk about the paranormal activity experience for a while, but I think you have spent a lot of time talking about yeah. it. There are a lot of resources out there. But I, to me, it's what's cooler is to talk about the takeaways from it mm-hmm. because you have this unique shooting experience where you're down in San Diego. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about how much of it you improvised, which is, by the way, a very different muscle than the muscle you perfect in a lot of acting classes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, it's a different there's a lot of freedom in it, but there also is a lot. There's nowhere to hide. You know, if if there's a, if there's a, a moment that it, that rings untrue, then it's just you can see it a mile away. Having not ever taken any improv classes, uh, the biggest lesson I've gotten just from what I understand about it is the whole yes and. It's the not putting up stop signs. It's the helping the, the back right. and forth. And I find that that works even in the, what I do with, with hosting and, and journalism yeah. where you have a partner and it's always about let's 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 keep it going. Yeah. Let's never put yeah. a stop sign. Yeah. But I think there are life lessons in that too. Yeah. I Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, it's it's – it's interesting. In college, I took this this one improv class that we took, and it, it, our teacher, Dan Day, who was a very, like, stoic man, we all thought that the class was going to be, like, how to be funny in improv. And he was like, no, this class is about being truthful in the moment. Because that's what people think it is. They right. think it's about, I got jokes. Right, right, I got right. lots of jokes. Yeah. And Michael Scott, I've got a gun. Yeah, it's that yeah exactly. Um, but it's what's, I think, really great about improv is that, you know, it's just being human. You know, maybe it ends up being funny. Maybe it ends up being sad. It doesn't matter. But you're just being authentic with another person. But the authenticity is what makes it yeah. funny, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. S- although paranormal activity is not, not so funny. but it's Not unless you like relationships crumbling and people getting possessed. Then super funny. There are some who would love that. <laughs> uh, so you had this experience with a movie that you felt from the beginning mm-hmm. was this is going to be something special. But then it, it doesn't come out. For a while. For years, and, yeah. and are you just thinking, all right, I just did this thing and whatever? Or are you, you still kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop? We never uh, – I mean, I we knew we, – we were shooting it and we felt so committed to it and so wanted it to be the best it could be. And we got along so well. Like immediately it was clear that three, the three of us were meant to be together, you know. And so – but we never – I never thought, man, this is going to, you know, spawn a franchise. Like that was not in my head. Mm-hmm. And in the three years following – I believed something would happen. I believed I didn't I didn't have Three any This is a long time. It is a long time. I to plant I had, a seed and wait for something to grow. And you know what? Here's people laugh at vision boards, but I had one on my wall and it said this is no lie. It said um by August 2009, I want to be financially independent. I want to be looking for a home. I want paranormal activity to be a success, and I want to be in a relationship. I had it all. And for three years, every day, I'd be like, oh, yeah, that. And I'd keep working. It's not like I sat there and stared at it all day and didn't do anything. But I I worked hard, and mm-hmm. th- that was in my head. And I, I'm telling you, not August. It was two months later in October, all of those things. And I, like, took it off my wall. You know, and I was like, well, okay, what's next? I got to get a vision board. It's it's It's, I mean, you know. I don't think it's just the board. I think it's what you put your focus on. But it was a nice reminder every day to, you know, what we were going for. But I never, I never, I never, we never knew. It was, I mean, when the movie came out, I was working at City Walk. I had, I mean. Still Buca de Beppo? Yeah. And I put in my two weeks the day the movie, you're like the same weekend that the movie opened in theaters and we knew it was going to be, you know, a big thing. And so people would go see the movie at that movie theater, walk across City Walk, come into the restaurant, sit down in my section, and I'd be like, hey, guys, welcome to Buga de Beppo. And they'd freak out. They'd be like, what? Are you? You look like the girl. I'm like, yeah, 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 I am. I've got like 
nine more days before I can leave here, you know, because I just couldn't. No, nope, not me. I couldn't. Somebody else. By the way, I'm Katie. So if you need some <laughs> extra Parmesan, let me know. Let me know. I don't know. Everybody was like, why didn't you just go? And I was like, I, I told them I'd work two weeks. I'm going to do it. You know. So that's the Texas. In you, that is 100 percent. 100 percent. My dad. Yeah. Um, so you brought up your dad. Mm hmm. How supportive were your folks while you're out here and you're trying to make it work and you got this thing in the can, but you're waiting tables and... They were always so supportive. Um, and how important was that to I, staying out here? I mean, I think I don't have anything else to compare it to. I've always had really supportive parents. Um, but the more I look at other people's experiences, whether it's volunteering and hearing people talk to me on the phone or, or friends or whatever, and I see people who, who have parents who aren't supportive, I more and more am grateful for for what my parents have done and continue to do for me. I mean, my mother is like the most emotionally supportive person ever. I can tell her anything. It doesn't matter what I do or who I am. As long as I am being authentic, she's happy for me. And she, you know, and my dad doesn't always understand this life that I've chosen. Um, but despite not understanding, he supports me anyway, which is which is really cool of him, you know. Invaluable. And he put, I mean, you know, he's like a retired police officer, you know, rancher from Texas who put me through theater school at SMU. Like that man worked hard so that I could go play zip zap zop and you know prance around like an animal and playing tag in, in a movement class for four years. And he did it because that's what I wanted to do, and that is pretty big, you know. Man, that's a huge lesson. Yeah. Uh, I always knew that my parents were supportive. My dad drove me out here and likes to tell the story about how when he turned around to get on the tent and head back home, just tears. Oh. And it was all I could do to keep from stopping and coming back and taking me back to Texas with him. And my mom as well. Both of my parents were unbelievably supportive. Uh, but it was so much – that's so much part of the fabric of my relationship with him that right. I don't even think that it, it – I was aware of that. Right, same. I just yeah. knew that they were, if something, if it was something I wanted, they were going to try to help me yeah. get it, achieve it, whatever. All right. So you decide to put in your two weeks notice. Was that the moment when you thought, okay, like not, not I've arrived because that, that kind of suggests some kind of, of stasis or something. Yeah, yeah. And even like a materialism, but more like, all right, I can take a breath. I, I, I'm. I've reached a plateau that is one I wanted to reach. Um, no, it felt like I'm so glad I can pay my rent every month and not worry about that. Thank you, Jesus. Like, I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. And the other part of it was like, I felt like I had been thrown into the choppy waters of, of the darkest, deepest part of the ocean. And it's like, sink or swim, Katie. Like, it was a very, um, it was a, it was a huge life shift that, ha that after three long years really happened overnight. And there is no preparing for that. And so – Because you go from the tables – table 11. To Jay Boca. Leno. You know, like what is that? I mean I, re I, I remember we had – thank goodness Mika was there and we could do it together because we had – I had never done any publicity ever. And then we had like day one of publicity and there was the Paramount people, you know, and my manager was there and we're like – Billy Bush was my first interview. Billy Bush interviewed me and uh, – and – and then we had a full a There's full a joke day. in there somewhere. I'm just I mean, too lazy to make it's, it. It's interesting. He never once looked me in the eye. And so I always remembered that. I was always like, why is this guy not like looking at me? Like, what's what's going on here? It was very strange. Um, but um, but but uh, yeah, it was just it was crazy. It was really, really crazy. And a lot of it is a huge blur. And it's interesting because it's now years later that I'm sort of unpacking some of that stuff. And we're, and, we're not like we're almost 10 years. Well, 10 years from filming it. And then, but was it 08, 09 when it? It came out in like right around October of 09. I'm pretty yeah. sure it's 2017. Is That's it like now? eight years. Time flies. Golly. And when was the, I guess it's been like two years or three years since the last one I was in. Yeah. That was a huge, huge chunk of time. But I, I like the fact that it's a blur though, because it, it is like this thing that you aspire to, not the, not the publicity and all that stuff, but, but the opportunity mm -hmm. to have something that people are seeing and responding to. Yeah. And then it happens and it is like, Go. Yeah, it's it is crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. Um, and there was a lot of really, a lot of really amazing moments that you know that I actually went and did a storytelling show the other night, and I talked about Paramount turned 100 years old at some point 
recently, past few years, and they had this big epic photograph that they organized and they invited, I mean, all these legends, Harrison Ford and Tom Cruise and Meryl Streep and me, you know, what am I doing there, you know, but it was amazing. And, and I, you know, had the opportunity to, and I, I mean, I was so like socially terrified. I was just like, who am I going to talk to in this room? Um, that it ended up being really fun. And I got to thank Steven Spielberg for, for his input in the movie, which was you know, like this thing that I he, had, cha- he helped change the ending. He right? did. He like <clears throat> saw it, and then he was like, "I like it. I've got some notes, you know." And and so we went and did reshoots. He wasn't there for them, but we went and did reshoots based on his his notes. And basically, his biggest note was like, "Don't kill Katie. Like, let her character live," which was my appreciate. Thank you, yes, Steven. thank you, Mr. Spielberg. Um, and so I I got to like shake his hand and thank him, and he was so kind to me. And you know, so there's things like that that happened that I just think of like, wow, I can't believe that was me. I can't believe that that. I really had had the opportunity to have that moment, and um, so it was a crazy, a crazy time. Yeah. So the the hard thing is you do this, and now you got to follow it up. Yeah, which is, and, and yeah, and and what is that? I think that goes back to like what I was talking about earlier about did I really like? Because when the dust kind of settled a little bit, a lot of a lot of the world I really liked, and a lot of the world I really didn't like, and I didn't know what what part of me really wanted to be an actress or what kind of actress I wanted to be. I don't have any desire to be really famous or to be um, a, a big movie star. Um, there's some cool stuff that comes along with that, but I don't think it's a life that – and I always thought I did. You know, I always thought, of course, I'm going to win an Oscar. I'm going to, you know, X, Y, and Z. The truth is, is that I don't, that's not in my soul. Like that is not my what my passion is. I want to like make really great indie movies and I would love to be on a TV show, you know. I, I always want to be able to go to the grocery store and go home and have nobody care that I was at the grocery store and nobody snap a picture like that. You know, like whatever that sweet spot is in the middle, that's where I want to that's where I want to live with that. Have you had that experience in the past? Um, not with paparazzi. They don't really care. But um, I, and I always love when fans say hi or, or, you know, and that happens and that's great. I mean, there's nothing anybody who says they're like annoyed by people who appreciate something that that they've done i don't buy it it's lovely i just want to like hug them all and like ask them like what's your name like tell me about you you know it's really cool it's a nice moment it was interesting that you that you just brought up the what's your name tell me about you aspect because tony hale oh yeah brought up the same thing and Mm -hmm. he said one he genuinely is fascinated because he wants to know what is it about this person that whatever i did resonated with right and two he doesn't want it to be about him because that's it's a two way. Yeah, it's a two way thing, and it yeah. is kind of weird. Well, they're putting of, themselves out there by saying by saying something. They're putting themselves out there by by sharing this gift of like, hey, I really liked X, Y, and Z. And so my response is like, oh, thank you. Let me learn about you. Let me let me have a moment with you versus just like absorbing your accolades, which is unhealthy. What about bad fan moments? Um, I haven't had any in person. I'm really thankful for. But I've, there's this thing called the internet. Ah, uh, the internet. Uh, I. I, I remember back in the day, I used to, I used to read the IMDb comments. Oh it yeah, is the it was like the depths of terrible. If you're ever in like a downward spiral and you want to just like keep going, Whoa, I the internet comments that's got to be. They the way to disabled go. it on IMDb now, which is so good. And I wish they had disabled it ten years ago because it was not good for me to, to 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 read. I have some creepy. I have a few creepy fans. Well, and and especially for females, yeah. it is a. I mean, I I don't think I'm exaggerating to say a tenfold increase yeah. in the amount of negative, creepy, disgusting stuff. Yeah, but it's also what do you focus on, you know? And and I either block those people or send them on their way. And yeah. and um and you know, ninety eight percent of people are are awesome. And I and everyone I've ever met in person has been genuine and lovely. That's all. That's yeah. special. Yeah, it's it's great. So. These are fans who have come up to you. They've seen you and want to tell you how much they love your work. Yeah. Who have you had an opportunity to do that to and kind of geek out about? Oh, man. Whether in a professional setting or even just living here in Los you Angeles. Know, that I've actually expressed it to. I, I'm so shy about that stuff. I think, um, I mean, Steven Spielberg was pretty great. I didn't like go on and on about his career. I just literally, I think, cried in front of him and thanked him and shook his hand. So that was pretty good. Um I get that way about musicians a lot. Like I really – like Bob Schneider is my favorite musician and I've been listening to him since I was 19. So all through my 20s, like very formative years to listen to like one 
you know, artist who's so versatile. Well, the, and the cool thing about that, too, is Bob Schneider's a guy that nine out of ten people aren't familiar right. with. Right. So but like, you geek yeah. out about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I feel like I've got this, like, kind of secret that, like, no one else – it's like, i got to share him with everyone so that, you know. Especially, I think, when you're here. If you lived in Texas – Everybody, well, yeah. Right. But it's here, and, in, in, like, if you go to a Bob uh, Schneider sh- uh, show on the Texas, strip, it yeah. is like, mm-hmm. it's Bob Schneider. Like, come on, guys. Yeah. And – at some point over the years, you know, after the movie came out or whatever, like we became friends and, and the Clint um, who did the EP with me was his guitar player. And so and it was cool because I did this short film a couple of years ago. And and when I was in college, I went to a Bob Schneider concert and I told him after the show, he didn't have any idea who I was. I was just some girl. And I was like, Bob, someday I'm going to move to Los Angeles and be an actress. And I'm going to put your music in all of my movies. And he was like, cool, cool, cool. All righty. And then I remembered that. And then, you know, years later, I'm doing this short film, and it's the first big thing that I've produced my, on my own. And we have this montage at the end, and I'm like, oh, man, we don't have any budget. Like, I don't have any money to pay him. I was like, but this song would be so beautiful in it. And I was like, well, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to see. If he says no, my heart won't be broken. It'll be okay. So I put it – I did an edit of the, of the movie with his song in there. But I emailed him, and I, I said, here's a, a version of my short film. And I was like – you know, this is our situation. You know how much I respect you. If if you're open to it, I would love to use your song, you know. And if not, that's absolutely okay. I respect that too. And he like got back to me right away and he was like, yeah, Katie, great movie. Sure, here's the song. And and it was like this, he'll never, for him, it's just, uh, you know, an email he got once. But for me, it was like, we're thinking back to that 19-year-old girl who was in college and like loves this guy's music. And here I am being able to put it in my movie it was really cool. That is pretty rad. Yeah. Um, I'm, it is weird here because you you'll go to the Grove and you'll see. I'm, my sister was in town a, a few weeks ago, and I have an eye for that. Mm-hmm. Like I'll see someone walk by in a hat and sunglasses and be like, "Oh, that's so and so." And meanwhile, everyone else is oblivious. So we're there, and Amy Adams mm. comes by. I'm like, "Hey, Sarah, there's Amy Adams. Who? Where? No one else notices." And so she, for her to even like get a glimpse, right, it was such a right, big deal. Right. But it, I, I think it is cool to be able to have a chance when you see someone whose work you respect to communicate that. Yeah. I don't need an autograph. I don't need a picture. I just want to tell Say you that you. your work on XYZ was amazing. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen uh, Ricky Gervais's Derek show, Derek. I haven't it's seen good. that. It's really, really mm-hmm. good. Uh, to be able to say, hey, Ricky, Derek was special to me. Thank you. Aww. Or mm-hmm. uh, to quote Friday Night Lights at the beginning Aww. of uh, our podcast, as we did, to just let people know your work meant something yeah that's that, such that's a gift a, that's a cool thing to get to do here yeah that is really cool speaking of friday night lights what a show i you know it's, it's funny as you say that i'm realizing that i think the colors of the acoustic foam on this wall mm-hmm. i think these are dylan panther colors i mean obviously that was on purpose I yes of course subconsciously at least blue and black subconsciously you you did that quite well um so you mentioned your short film. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that Becoming? What was the name? Becoming, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, labor of love that must have taken, I can't imagine how many hours and- A lot of hours. It was a- it Dollars was, and friends and- Yeah. It was like a huge learning experience. It was amazing. And it, that was the first thing you had directed, for, right? I or, co-directed it. But, okay. Uh, but yeah, it was the first thing that we had done As you done expand together. your creator yeah, job title. title. And it's cool because we had such a tiny budget that um, Dave, who who wrote it um, and who directed it with me, he and I did a lot of things, a lot of jobs that we just couldn't pay people to do, you know, whether it was costume or set or, you know, all these things that I was like. Put those we, knitting skills to use. Exactly. Mm-hmm. All all of the things. And we kind of divvied them up sort of naturally. It just kind of fell to one or, one or the other. And it's cool because now that I've had a, a, a taste of doing those jobs, I will – really deeply appreciate the work that those people do in those roles in the future that when I do have the budget to, to hire people, you know, I'm going to really appreciate them and I'm going to have a little bit better of an understanding of what, what goes into it because I had a taste and I was like, man, it's hard. But I don't imagine that you're someone who needs that in the first place. I, I don't think, I think I would be appreciative no matter what, but right. I do think having an understanding of what goes mm-hmm. in, you know, it couldn't do anything but make me a better director producer, you know, right. you know, there's the difference between someone who's like, Hey, do this in, impossible task in five minutes. Thanks. Versus someone who's like, Oh wow. Okay. This is the I know situation. This is, take a while. Yeah. yeah. this is really my goal. Like, let's talk about how we can make it happen. You I, know, I feel like I have learned that same lesson though, that coming up in the ranks, starting in local news when I did, we had to shoot and edit our own stories. Mm. 
So you've got to go out there and with the field, the camera on your shoulder and you shoot the story. And then the, the best part is you got to shoot your own stand up as well. So you put it on the tripod, you lock it down, you press record, you go around, you shoot it, you come back, you look, oh, it's out of focus. You go back, you do it again. <laughs> oh, I cut my head off. You do it, you know, 20 times mm-hmm. later, you get it right. And then you go back and you edit it and then you realize, oh, there's so much that goes into this. Yeah. Uh, you have such a better grasp of, of all, of every aspect of getting it done. Yeah. So handling the catering on your own film yeah. and yeah. all that other stuff. It was it was a crazy, it was a really fun, um, I mean, we had some, we shot um, in the middle of the summer. It was in July, I think. And we had this, our last day of shooting, there's a lot of crazy things that happened, but at the, the last day of shooting, we shot this outdoor wedding scene. And now I am in a wedding dress outside and it was, we were in a drought, you know, in the valley. And I wake up that morning and I can hear thunder. And it was like the soundtrack to my anxiety. I was like, oh, my gosh, no way. Mm -hmm. And this thunderstorm rolls in and lightning. The lighting guys wouldn't even put up a light, you know. And Dave and I looked at each other and we're like, well, we got to get the shot. So let's just do what we're going to do. And we rolled with it and we like adjusted things. And it ended up being kind of this beautiful creative accident that that made the the movie better. Um, But it was it was stressful in the moment, but it was cool that we could have an obstacle and, and turn it into something that actually served us. You know, those kinds of learning experiences I think are invaluable. By the way, for people who aren't from this area, I can, I've been here 16 years and I can count on one hand the number of thunderstorms I mean, I've heard in Los Angeles. And it was just that one day I was like, I like on the way to set was, went to the big five near where I live and bought all the tarps, all the, you know, um, like the, the rain jackets for crew. Cause I was like, we're going to be soaked. And I was like, everyone I was like, Hey, do you pray? Can you just pray that it doesn't rain on, on like, just let, let we get the shot. No, do you just send good vibes? Like just thoughts, whatever, whatever you want to do, just send it to us. We really need it. You know, pray for rain for the farmers. Yes. Yeah. Rain. Drought just not at that set. one house in Reseda. Like just, just carve out that one backyard. Um, but we got it done. So obviously the paranormal activity experience was this huge personal and professional highlight yeah since then what have been the the touchstone moments that you look back and you're like that was satisfying yeah. that was that really worked for me pushed my buttons i think it's all the things i've been making on on my own because there was a period of time where i was auditioning quite a bit but not from a good place and so i wasn't booking what, is that, what does that mean not from a good place? i was doing it from a from a really fearful place from a, a place of feeling ungrounded and not owning my worth and not, you know, sharing my light and sharing, you know, my authenticity with people. And so when you do that over and over again, it kind of like is this kind of uh, repetitive cycle that is that doesn't work. Right. And so then I I recognized what I was doing. I was like, man, I'm better than this. Like, I this is not this isn't this. Something's got to change. And stopped auditioning for like a couple of years, which was awesome. It's the greatest thing ever. I love which is not what you expect to hear from. An right. Actress. Well, and that was my thing. I was like, wow, maybe there's a big world out there. Maybe I don't need to be doing this and started making my own things. And that was really transformative, whether it was the short film or the music or the web series or this feature that I'm working on. You know, I'm writing a book, which is kind of like a compilation of all these story. I've, I've started storytelling. And so I every time I write a new story, I kind of file it away. Hmm. And I don't know who's going to read it. I don't know. I don't know when I, I'm going to have it out in the next five years. I don't know who's going to this podcast. But so that's I, the thing, you know, it's like, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because, you know, I just feel it in myself that I that I need to. Um. So you so it's it's the things that you've done on your own. It's the it's the challenging yourself and the yeah. fulfillment that comes from that and the and the on a like a emotional spiritual level it was like through this process even though there were some like you know pretty tough times i had this opportunity to get to know myself more and to own my worth more and to love myself more and all these things that it challenged me to do hmm. and so i'm a i'm a better version of myself now a happier version of myself now because i've gone through that than i would have been able to be had i had had the road just been real easy, um, if that makes sense. And so I, I'm grateful for that now. And it's cool because now I'm auditioning again. And I was in Hawaii last week with my mom and I got this email from this casting director and she was like, hey, we've got a role that's great for you. Can you come in on Thursday? And I was like, no, I'm in Hawaii. Can I, can I send it in and on tape? And she was like, sure, just get it to me by Thursday morning. So, you know, there I am in Hawaii setting up the, my iPod, like on the bed, on top of a trash can, like trying to get the angle right. My mom's reading my lines with me and we had the best time, you know, it was so fun. And, and, and I was like, that's what auditioning is. That, that kind of like 
just sharing your truth and then moving on, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's cool to come back to that. Biggest lesson you think you've learned in this whole process? Um, That everybody has a voice that deserves to be heard and no one, um, don't ever allow anyone to, to quiet your voice. That's that's the biggest lesson. Is there a, a single moment or a collection of moments that inspired that? Um, I think it's a collection of moments of of absorbing because there's a choice, right? You in Hollywood or in any industry, you're going to be told lots of things, and you have a choice: like, do I absorb all of this, or do I stand my ground? And there was a time when I absorbed all of the negative stuff. Right. And all the people who are like, yeah, you need to be different and you need to do this better. And and I just took it personally and I absorbed it because I didn't have that foundation of of who I was in this industry. And and now I'm in a place where I, I can hear all that stuff and I can I can take in the, the ones that really feel right. And the rest of it, I just go, hey, thanks. And I am me. And, and I recognize that, you know, I am enough and you are enough and. You know, it's, we're not going to be the greatest fit for everyone, but when you find your tribe, like that's that's the that's the good stuff. You the know? find your tribe yeah. part is yeah, key. yeah, really. Um, Which goes back to the support, I think, element from before. Yeah, and the finding your community that you want to be having those moments with, and creating with, and communing with, and hmm. um, that's the good stuff. Next dream job for you. Hmm. Um, I would really love to um, have a small production company. I have a production company called Text Love Films, but I would like to someday have, uh, you know, a small office and an employee or an intern or two and some windows and, uh, you know, some succulents by the door. (laughs) Windows. Now you can slow your roll there. No way. I'm putting it up on the vision board. (laughs) <laughs> windows windows production company with windows yes i like that um i think that's that's that would be it i think i'd, I'd love to be on a tv show um mm. like a comedy well, maybe really the tv love. show pays for the production company there you go yeah um and uh i'd love to keep volunteering and doing work in that world it's not really a job but it's just become a really big part of my life so i love that as well what's the volunteering by the way you want to talk about it I, yeah i volunteer at the suicide crisis line and i never uh, really knew anything about that world. Um, I knew that that line existed, but I had never called it. Um, but it is really, oh, man, it is some powerful stuff to to be there for people when and to listen when they're having when they're just sad. Because the thing is, is I've never I've been doing it for like six months now, and I've never had the same call twice. But every call is the same in that people just want to feel heard and they want to feel loved. And it's it's amazing the amount of lonely people out there who feel the exact same way and think they're the only ones. So it's something so beautiful about sitting with someone in the in that dark place and just being with them and while they kind of get themselves out of it, at least in the moment. It's really it's really beautiful and and, you know, sounds I think maybe sadder than it really is. It's it's a it's it's great. There's universality to that, though, that desire to be heard and yeah, and oh yeah, understood and I mean that's all in, that's all anybody who calls in really even it doesn't matter how it comes out if it comes out sideways if it comes out directly if it hmm. you know it's always that I have yet to have someone who that wasn't really underneath it. And, well, I, um, I, I, I'm sure they're happy to have resources there to yeah to provide that listening and understanding. Yeah, it's a good group of people over there, so I'm thankful to be a part of it. You mentioned Text Love mm-hmm. as the name of your company. Yeah. That does bring up the, the Texas element. How would you compare and contrast life in Texas and Ooh. life here in Oh, wow. LA? What a great question. Um, yeah, I miss the sunsets in Texas. I miss the thunderstorms. Um, I miss my family. Boy, when it rains here, I am I just, so happy. I mean, my heart just kind of like rejuvenates when it happens. It sounds. This sounds like a first world problem. But 300 plus days of sunshine a year, mm-hmm. like, come on, can we get some clouds every yeah. once in a while? Oh, Maybe some man. 40 degree temperatures. Oh, just some, I just want some thunder and lightning, you know? I just want to- Is that oh, too much to ask? Gosh, it's so great. I um, I always kind of had one foot in Texas and one foot in LA. And I think this past year- Still kind of, yeah, you definitely- I mean, I do in the sense that I'm always going back to see my nephew and my family. Like that's that'll never change. Mm-hmm. But, but I, I have recently in the past year- um, 
recognize that I, I'm choosing L.A. now not because I'm an actress who has to be here, but because I'm a person who really enjoys the community here. You know, I really enjoy the, this family of friends that I have around me and the mindset of, the, of, of these people that are that I've surrounded myself with and the way we all look at the world and how, you know, in, in the group and the world that I'm in in L.A., it's very accepting and very, you know, it's just a, it's just a it would be hard for me to leave this. It'd be really hard to leave this. So. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, I, buddy of mine, Mike Trozo from Texas, but came here after college. Mm -hmm. uh, I always give credit to him for this quote, but he said, I, I was raised in Texas, but I grew up in California. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, and mm -hmm. it sums it up. I mean, I am very much Texas to the core. That's Me too. home. I go back as often as I can, like I know you do. Yeah. But uh, the challenges of being here, those are played a huge role in taking the person that Texas helped raise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm a big believer in the value of challenges and yeah. this place is certainly been yeah. part of it. But I, I think for, uh, for my wife and I, who's not also not from here, the community here, the diversity, mm -hmm. all the things you mentioned, I, I can't echo that enough. Yeah. And man, I love going home. Oh, there's nothing better than, than getting on my dad's farm and like walking out in the pasture or getting in the Jeep and driving out in the pasture and just like seeing sky and the sun. Like literally I will like put my hands in the dirt and be like, oh, this is the same dirt that I was on when I was 12 and I was reading Nancy Drew books in this tree. Like, you know, it's something. It's so, so beautiful. Got a little bit Nancy Drew book. You know, I read a lot of them. Got yeah, them, Hardy got them Boys. At the, the book stop. That's Hardy where Boys, I yep. Yeah. Um, best queso in Texas. Oh, man, it's been so long since I've had queso in Texas. I feel like a bad Texan for saying that. Uh, my mom's, obviously. Um, but it, in a restaurant? I don't know. I wish I had a bit, I wish I had an answer for you. I don't. I think Papacito's is solid. Yeah. We're a fan of Papacito's. Well, part of the reason I, I mentioned queso was because you were very kind to bring me queso as a gift. Yeah. I, I am still which my, overjoyed by that. Which my mother made on her last day in Los Angeles. And, I, and it was very, I was like, mom. Thank you, Katie's mom. Yep. I so. really appreciate that. Which kind of brings me to uh, the tail end of this because I don't like people to leave <gasps> here without gifts. So as you came bearing what? gifts, uh, I wanted you to have <gasps> this gift. Wow. Uh, if you are familiar with Lisa Fain, she oh is the author gosh. of the Homesick Texan Cookbook. This is amazing. This is her queso cookbook. This is amazing. A little backstory uh, for folks uh, unaware of our queso history. Yeah. We do like to tweet about queso. We have a like a call like an SMU TCU rivalry and a and a queso rivalry friendly rivalry yes of course and i figured oh, uh, you great. might be able to one up me with miss fane's this is great excellent work there uh i almost Thank got you. the homesick texan cookbook but you might have that one already so i, I was don't. like this is a more appropriate i mean this this is perfect yeah this is perfect. So uh, thank you. If you've listened to the podcast, you know I don't like people to leave empty handed. Uh, you are lucky though because you get to double up. What? You get this two. This is so great. This is the best. Two day. gifts. <gasps> yes. Oh, this is awesome. So for the listeners, listeners at home, this is mm -hmm. a Texas themed t shirt. Oh, this is so great. You always have great Texas shirts. You know, whenever you like post I have pictures a decent, on. Thanks. I've got you've a got like collection. A, yeah. My sister has helped me with that. Yeah. I have a, I have a few, um, but this is this is at the top of the Texas list. Texas Forever, TX Four E. That's like so great. Yeah. So enjoy some queso. And I and enjoy I also, a Texas I'm gonna t -shirt. wear my T-shirt and eat the queso that I made from the cookbook. It's gonna be great. Thank you, Mark. All right. So before we say goodbye, uh, mm -hmm. any last uh, things you want people to check out? Of course, they can find you on Twitter at Katie Diane. Uh, Instagram is real Katie Featherston. Yeah. Um, those, those pictures are, of Harvey and succulents. Uh, yeah, all um, of the all of, and some Hawaii selfies pictures. in Hawaii. Yes, yeah. they can find oh, all that great stuff. So great. Um, you could. They can also. Everyone can go check out katiefeatherston com, which has a link to my short film and my web series and the music and all the stuff. Yeah, we didn't mention the web series by the way, which yeah. I wanted. Let's. You can give a yeah. pitch for that as well. It's called Solace for the Unloved, and it's about a woman in her like early thirties whose life is falling apart, and she's trying desperately to keep it all together. <laughs> Um, it's very. It was very fun to make. It's entertaining and, to watch. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of the it's kind of the comedic. It's the darker side of 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 being single and like wondering what's happening in your life, but it's done in a comedic way. So, I think it was it was really fun to make. Well, good. Yeah. Well, I uh, hope everyone gets a chance to check out that. 
find all your projects. You know, Halloween is coming up as we yes. take this. This will uh, air after Halloween. But, cool. it, you know, but really, paranormal activity will scare the pants off of you no matter what time of year it is. That's true. So let's end it how we began. Clear eyes. Full arts. Texas forever. <sighs> so good. Ah, Texas forever. Well, hopefully those of you that are not Texas natives could still appreciate our chat. The biggest takeaway for me was the idea that the journey is more important than the destination and and also how powerful creating can be, that creativity can exist in a variety of forms. It doesn't have to be artistic. You can create in business, in housekeeping, in how you raise your kids, in life in general. And I think a big part of embracing that is not letting fear dictate your choices. So I appreciate Katie sharing those lessons with us. Hopefully those are ones we can all appreciate. Speaking of, I appreciate Katie taking the time to share her story and for sharing her queso. And I appreciate you for listening. As always, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and will subscribe, tweet it out, share with your friends. Uh, Also share your feedback with me on Twitter or Instagram. You can find me at Mark Iztook. That's Mark with a C. On Facebook at Mark Iztook TV. And you can read more online at marcustook.com slash dreamjob. Until next time, thanks for listening.